Thank you. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Cheers. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thank you so much, JP, for this wonderful opportunity to come halfway around the world and share my story with you this afternoon. Um, I'm a little bit overwhelmed to be in your company. It's uh, such a blessing, so thank you very much for this. I'm talking a little bit about confluence today. Um, confluence is not just in my own personal experience, but I guess the confluence that exists as well in my own cooking, in Filipino cooking. And I should start off, I guess, by telling you a little bit about my personal story. Um, I grew up in Manila, born and raised. And in 1971, I was extricated um, for political reasons. My family went into political exile and we moved to New York. And um, it was a good time to be in New York, I think, in the 70s. Um, it was a time when there was an influx, actually, of uh, many Italian people, young people setting up new kinds of restaurants there, very different from the red sauce type restaurants that existed in New York at that time. And I guess for a young girl like me, being in such a melting pot um, uh, situation like in New York, it really influenced me and got me really interested in, in the food that existed in the city. Um, I got a job, um, luckily, um, with the fur licensee of a very big Italian brand, Valentino. And eventually, I ended up working with the Valentino rep office. And I guess that's where this whole love affair with everything Italian started. It was a good way to learn about how to develop a strong brand. And I was very blessed to work there. But I think more than the fashion part, I thought I loved fashion. I, I would cook for my friends, the Italian friends that I met. Um, I loved making pasta because of all the Italian restaurants that I got to visit. And I spent so much time making excuses for people to get together so that I could cook for them. It was also the time when Martha Stewart got big, her book was launched, and I felt like I was channeling her, setting the table, creating the ambiance. So this was like, what was getting me in the gut, not so much the fashion, but more the preparing food and, and serving people, nurturing them with my cuisine. Now, um, fast forward 1985, my grandfather passed away. We all went back to Manila. Unfortunately, we missed the Edsa Revolution. He missed the Edsa Revolution by three months. Um, that's when Marcos left and our country became better. Um, but Manila space was a bit slow for me. I was a bit used to New York space. And that whole thing of me wanting to learn how to cook Italian food in the place where I should learn it, I bugged my mom and she said, OK, you can go. So I went to Florence. I'm not much of a planner, but maybe I was lucky that the lady that I found to teach me was a home cook. Her name was Masha Innocenti. And she was just teaching out of her apartment. Um, aside from that, I learned from two other Italian um, signoras, one in Rome, Jo Betoya, and another lady in Milano, Ada Parasiliti. So my, I guess my exposure was more the home style, which I think was a real blessing um, direction-wise. Um, aside from that, it was just four very short months, but I was by myself going through a process of self-discovery. And I think I learned more from just being in Italy, going to the markets, eating out with my friends. I'm sure you all know how generous Italian people are about you know, sharing information about food. All of them, even if they don't cook, they all know about food. So it was a real good immersion for me. So I went back to Manila. And I really kind of like wanted to test whatever I knew on everyone there. So I cooked for people, friends of friends, friends of my mom. And I would just like have one assistant carry the vegetables with me and go around and cook in people's homes. And um, I was in my 20s, um, still kind of on party mode. So it took me maybe 10 years to kind of earn my stripes and realize that success in the food business is not about how People in the front of the house tell you, oh, your food is so good. But it's what happens in the back of the house. It's learning discipline, responsibility, being on time, all of that. It took me a while to learn that until 1997, when I finally opened my first restaurant. This is Chibo. It's an Italian cafe. And my real intention for it was to kind of um, improve the level of shopping mall food in the Philippines. As you know, we're a shopping mall country, like many Asian countries. And um, I'm very lucky and very happy to say that we're 19 years old now with 11 stores all over the city. 
Um, my other restaurant um, is Luso, it's a champagne bar, and it's meant actually to give Manila um, that old world elegance sort of experience that Manila sorely lacks because we didn't respect too much of our heritage spaces for a while. Um, then, this one is kind of like my crown jewel at the, the moment. It's called Grace Park, and it's really a homage to the farmers in the Philippines um, who are doing organic produce, and at the same time, a place to showcase like indigenous ingredients that we've taken for granted, that are all over the Philippines, sometimes growing mostly in the backyards of people's homes, all throughout our 7,100 islands. And it's, um, it was built um, with like, recycled furniture and all of that. So it's a, a real homage to sustainability. My newest one is Alta. It's a, in, a, in an Ascot hotel. And because I guess my background is more home style and kind of a la minute cooking, bringing that to a hotel experience is a real challenge. Um, as we know, hotels like to prepare early. So that's, that's what I'm very preoccupied with at the moment. Um, but aside from that, I think it's more my catering business that's allowed me to really have a venue to rediscover my own cooking, Filipino cuisine. And um, I've had a chance to actually engage government to help us in the industry kind of promote not only the cuisine, but our ingredients as well. So the Department of Agriculture and Department of Tourism in our country has been very supportive. They've allowed us to join um, many chefs' congresses, like Food on the Edge, and um, things like Identita Golose, Madrid Fusion, that now does Madrid Fusion in Manila as well. We're on our second year there. And um, just all these opportunities to bring our cuisine out there to you um, in, in the rest of the world and to see how beautiful our ingredients can be and ergo how beautiful our country is as well. That's pretty much what's keeping me preoccupied um, at the moment. And I would like to share with you a little bit about what Filipino cuisine is. We have a little video. So Filipino cuisine is influenced by two things. The first obviously would be the terroir and what you find through the archipelago, 7,107 islands. And of course, the external influences that came in to influence the cooking. Um, our, we were already um, a very Malay-influenced place before external influences came in. And because we are the gateway through Asia, a lot of trade with Chinese traders also influenced our cooking. And of course, come 1521, when the Spanish came and colonized us, 333 years of influence via Mexico because of the galleon trade. So actually, there's more Mexican influence in our cooking than Spanish. Then, 48 years of American rule. That's probably why we have hot dogs in our spaghetti. And that halo halo dessert is an iconic dessert that means mix mix, which is the best representation of what our cuisine is. In Luzon, the main top island, we're very insular, so meat dishes, fermentation. The Visayas is where I'm from, seafood, the islands, chilies, coconut, um, and like tons of, of uh, seafood and shellfish. Then we go down south to Mindanao, where our Muslim brothers are, and that's where the influence, of course, is more Malay, closer to the cooking of Indonesia and Malaysia. The most prominent flavor profile in our cooking is really sourness. So a lot of our dishes we do with an extensive amount of different types of vinegar and souring agents. So that's a sinigang, a sour soup, which I will talk about a little bit more later. And at the same time, we have souring agents that are different and endemic to all the parts of the Philippines. So from our iconic lime, the calamansi, You'll find other things from leaves, tamarind tops, um, guava, um, unripe mangoes, um, alibangbang leaves, dayap is another kind of lime. So the souring ingredients are just so plentiful all over our country. Now, um, why did it take so long for our cuisine to get out there? Asian cuisines, other Asian cuisines like Thai and Vietnamese have kind of surpassed us and you know, have become sort of more familiar to the rest of the world. And we're thinking, those of us in the industry, it took us maybe a bit more time, partly because of um, our sense of national identity, maybe a little bit about the colonial mentality that exists. 
We never used to entertain people in Filipino restaurants. We would cook Filipino food at home. But nowadays, there's this new resurgence of a sense of pride, and I'm thinking that it might be a confluence of events as well. I'm thinking even things like Typhoon Haiyan that put us on the global stage, made all of you take notice of our country, not just how resilient we were as a people, but at the same time, many of you were able to see how beautiful our country was, whether just on TV, or for those of you who came to our country to help us at that time, I think that maybe it was also a chance for us to feel really proud about our own cooking as well. So I would imagine, I think in the last maybe seven years, there's been this new resurgence um, and interest in our, in our cooking. So much for JP to come and invite me to speak to you today. So um, I think that Maybe to end, I would like to show you a little bit of what I've done with some of our iconic dishes. We're doing three um, iconic Filipino dishes to show you. The first one is a sinigang. Like you saw earlier, sinigang is really a sour soup. You can make it out of fish, chicken, beef. But what I did here is I'm doing a dry sinigang where I extracted the flavors of the sour soup. And with sinigang, we do it also sometimes thickened with a miso paste. And um, this was a dish that I did at a state dinner for the Emperor of Japan very recently, about two months ago, no, maybe six months ago. And um, we're making the intense um, sinigang paste there to be uh, served together with a, with a beautiful piece of Bohol white marlin that comes from the Visayas. So this is um, kind of like a reduced intense sinigang instead of it being in a soup. It's in a, in a glaze or, or a paste. We're going to sear the marlin very quickly on both sides. It's one of the fattiest fish that we have. Since we're a warm, um, warm um, water country, not too many of our fishes are, are rich and fat. So this marlin works very well. So we sear it lightly. And then, of course, all the vegetables that are found in a sinigang are used to garnish the dish, from the radish to the eggplant to our long string bean, and of course, the tomato, which we use as a souring agent. And because it was for the Emperor of Japan, I always like to honor the guest with something familiar to them. And since we eat sour and balance it with either salty or sweet, I use the um, Muscovado raw sugar teriyaki to counteract the sourness of the sinigang glaze and garnished it with a cadena de amor, which is an old flower that my grandmother used to love. And we just found out that it's edible. So now many of our chefs use it to garnish our food. So this is a dry sinigang miso. A modern take, that's the classic dish you see on the screen. And we're just epoxing it with the, um, with the new dry sinigang. Thank you. The next dish is kinilaw, which is our ceviche. And um, actually, it's, it's really um, the difference with the ceviche is they use citrus only. In the Philippines, we use both vinegar and citrus to sour it. Now, because of my background with Italian food, this is the Emilia Romagna Artuzzi way of making a gnocco or a fried piece of dough. You do it pretty much, I guess, like a fresh pasta, the same technique. We put some pureed water spinach with one egg and 100 grams of flour and a little bit of lard. And we're going to roll out the gnocco. The dish is a mil hojas, or what you would call a mil feuille in French. I guess so it's a layered dish made with the sheets of the fried gnocco using um, our blue crab. So we're letting the dough rest for a bit. And as the dough rests, we'll be doing the rest of the ingredients for the dish. Um, this is the calamansi or calamunding juice, very, very sour lime that's typical in our country. A little bit of water, a little bit of white sugar to make a, a gel out of, the, out of the, the lime with a little bit of santan gum through the thermomix just to thicken it.
That's the gel. We're doing um, now um, a, a mousse out of the um, of some crab fat. So we're putting the santan gum with the cream. And you'll see this beautiful crab fat um, that comes from crabs that are this small. There's a lady who's 83 years old who made that particular one. And a sack of crabs this big will make just seven little bottles of the paste. And it's, it's I guess, like our version of caviar. So that's the consistency of the mousse. I actually have a bottle in my suitcase. I'll bring it tomorrow so some of you can taste it. So we're going to roll out the dough with a mattarello, the classic um, way, the way they do in Emilia Romagna. And uh, we'll eventually cut it into squares so we can fry it. Sorry, the music's a bit dramatic. <laughs> But the color of the water spinach is so vibrant, actually. It's, uh... So as you can see, I, I marry a little bit of what I learned in Italy, the respect for the ingredients and the simplicity of the way they work with their food. And it's helped me actually apply um, better techniques and, and better sort of principles when I prepare my own cuisine. These are blue crabs. They were just blanched um, very quickly and cooled and we'll take the meat and that goes um, as part of the dish. And you'll see which part we made into the kinilau or the ceviche. We, we're going to take some of the raw fat later. So these crabs are, are very sweet. We're now making the vinegar to make the ceviche or the kinilau. Um, just tuba vinegar that comes from coconut sap and then a little muscovado because I'm from Negros, sugar country, so I like to put sugar a lot in my cooking. And what we're doing here is um, we're pouring the vinegar into the raw crab fat. And you'll see that the crab fat will change in color because it's now being cooked by liquid fire, actually, just by the vinegar. So that goes on to the milojas. We're assembling the dish with the crab fat mousse. And then the fried gnocco, the crab meat. And, and kinilau is great because I think it existed even before the Spaniards came all over our country, depending on what seafood you have and um, what souring agents you have in the area. So there's been this debate whether the ceviche came from Latin America and went to Asia and went or went the other way around. So nobody knows really how it started, including what they do with pokey in Polynesia. It kind of like flowed from one side to the other. So there's the milojas with the kinilaw of the crab fat, the ceviche of the crab fat, the kalamunding gel. And this is the traditional kinilaw, the way we do our version of the ceviche. So you can see the, the way the two are very different and yet alike. The final dish is actually our classic adobo, which I'm sure many of you who have some Filipino friends, you probably smelled it if you had neighbors that were cooking the adobo beside you. And ba basically we deconstructed it here and I'm just making an adobo sauce um, with vinegar, soy, and because I'm negrense and I like sweet, it's an adobado, a little bit of a sweeter version of the adobo. Garlic, the vinegar, garlic, bay leaves, and pepper. Those are the basic ingredients. You just braise the adobo in a pot if you were to do a traditional meat one. And we just reduce that. And there are five eggs in the dish. So the first one is we're making an adobo of quail eggs. We're marinating the quail eggs in, in adobo sauce. And then we're curing an egg yolk, a regular chicken egg, that's the second egg, in 70% uh, salt and 30% sugar. 
until it solidifies um, 24 hours and has the texture almost like botarga di mugine, very firm. As you can see, the egg is hardened already just by curing it. Then the chicken, we're just removing the extra fat and we're going to cut it into squares and make chicken glass by putting it in the oven, the 375 degree oven, until it becomes crispy. So, the, so far that's two eggs and the chicken. Okay, the next is a century egg. This is used, I guess, in, in Chinese cooking a lot. It's buried in the earth until it develops the sulfur in the yolk. And we're just using the outer rind, the egg, what would have been the egg white is brown and like gelatinous. And we're pickling it in just vinegar and um, a little bit of sugar. And actually, adobo is always eaten with an achara or a pickle. So this is the, the pickled ingredient that we're going to add to the dish. Then salted red eggs, we're making a panacotta. These eggs are made by burying them in a mixture of mud and sea salt um, until they cure and the yolks become orange. We're making a panacotta with just a little bit of milk and the egg yolk and a little gelatin. So we're making the, the red egg panna cotta in the mold, chilling it, and this is the piece de resistance. I'm sure you've heard of the balut. This is the duck egg that develops the embryo in the center. Um, it's incubated, all the eggs are one on top of the other because the embryos are alive. Um, and we eat them boiled. But we're, I'm going to do it so that it's not so unpleasant looking. We're going to take the embryo, <laughs> remove the egg white and a little bit of the yolk, and we'll make a panna cotta out of it. <laughs> Actually, many of the Filipinos all over Europe, they make the balut here already. So you can find it if you find a Filipino food store. So we're making that panna cotta. It tastes good, it just doesn't look good, <laughs> I promise you. And they say it's very good for the knees, especially for the men. It gives you energy. <laughs> it has the best tasting broth as well. So we're putting it on top of the salted egg panna cotta, so making a two-layered panna cotta, and just put that in the chiller. And now we put the dish together, so that was, that's already the five eggs. Just a little bit of salted egg cream all over. Then our panna cotta is formed. Then the chicken glass. Then the salted uh, chicken egg yolk. Just the cured egg yolk, sorry. Then there goes the pickle, the achara of the century egg. And then finally, we'll put the quail egg, adobo. And that's our five eggs and a chicken in adobo. There's a little bit of oxalis or wood sorrel there, which um, was mentioned earlier in one of the presentations. And it's nice that we have it in both parts of the world. It grows like a weed in our country. The gardeners actually pull it out because it kills the ornamental plants. But we've recently discovered that it's a nice sour leaf, wonderful to be used in our cooking. So five eggs in a chicken adobo. That's the, the real adobo there with a the pickle in the back. 
And I guess in closing, I'd like to say that not only was there confluence in my personal journey, as well as confluence in Filipino cuisine, influenced by so many different things. And of course, the wonderful confluence that's happening here at Food on the Edge. For me to be amongst all of you kindred spirits, thank you so much, JP, and thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Karen, thank you. Karen, thank you.